Hey data junkies, welcome back to Statistics with your host, Sean Jansen. Uh, now we need to go back from our practical applied world of doing regressions in R, and we're going to take a step back for a minute. We're going to go back into theory land and put on our theory caps. So in this case, in this video, we're going to be looking at the assumptions for ordinary least squares. So keeping in mind as well that when we go into different types of regression, your assumptions will change. So this is going to be specific to the ordinary least squares. Now, let's talk about the assumption basis that we had before. Our model was some value of y equals an intercept value plus a coefficient times x plus some amount of error. We could also talk about that in terms of how much we could fit plus the residual. We could say that it's how much we could predict plus the residual. Or if you want to put it more of a layperson's terms, what we know plus what we don't. All right? And we said before that E or your error, that's a population error term, and a residuals is a sample error uh, observation term, just to kind of keep things straight in case we come across this. Now, when we're dealing with these assumptions, the predominant goal here is that we're going to be looking for patterns. And if things are behaving nicely, then things are random. Things are not going to have patterns to them. And in most cases, we're going to be hunting down the residuals to find out these differences here. Uh, we did a lot with residuals when we were dealing with ANOVA to see if we had normality checks and things like that. So this is sort of an extension of what we were working on previously. Now I have what I call the seven deadly assumptions of OLS. They aren't deadly in terms of like breaking your model or not, but they're all going to have some sort of impact on them. And I also just want to put the caveat on here that the seven assumptions I'm giving you here some of them are what I would consider a true OLS assumption. Some of them are just sort of like, these are good to have. If they don't, they can mess with you, but it's not a make or break. But I, I want the asterisk because I'm going to continue to say that if you take your stats learning uh, deeper and farther to take additional courses, depending on the courses you take and uh, how far you go into regression analysis, you're going to learn that some of these assumptions I'm telling you here can be expanded upon tested differently, uh, I contain other as, like, assumptions within them. So if you're out on the internet, and you're reading things across, and you find that some assumptions don't quite what I match here, keep in mind there that I'm kind of giving you the surface level here so we don't go have to too far down the rabbit hole, okay? So the first one is linear in the parameters. That is fancy stats talk if I ever heard it. What it means is that the linear model that we're building here your coefficients themselves, your Bs, should not be exponentiated, divided by other scores, or otherwise transformed. We can do that to our variables, our Xs, but we can't do that to the Bs. If we do that to the Bs, we are no longer linear in the parameters of the model that we are building. So this is not something that we need to like do a check on with, uh, in terms of like using R. We just need to make sure our model's set up that when we put our variables in, that the very not the variables, but uh, the, when we set it up to get the regression equation, that we are not intentionally manipulating to get our Bs transformed in some way. The second one is talking about right variables. This wants to make sure that the variables you're putting into your regression model itself are following the rules that we have for ordinary least squares regression. Again, this is one of those that are sort of the softer ones here. So it is the assumption that your dependent variable is interval ratio. You can squeak through the ordinals with five or more categories to pretend and masquerade as if it's uh, interval ratio. Your independent variables must be interval ratio as well. They have to be numeric. But we can also pose as numeric. Posing as numeric allows us not only to get those high category ordinals, but allows us to also use those binary independent variables as well. Those are the naturally dichotomous or nominal and low category ordinals that we have recoded into becoming dichotomous there. So either way, that meets the assumption. How do we check that? Know your data. Know what kind of variables that are going in. Know how they're coded. Know how the levels are working out. And if you fail this particular one, you could possibly have a bad model fit. You might not be using OLS appropriately, or OLS might not be the appropriate model for you. And you may be modeling something that's nonlinear or should be nonlinear. The third one is normally distributed errors. So that's talking about the residuals. Have to follow a normal distribution. This comes directly out of what we were talking about with the ANOVA lectures previously. So when we're talking about these, this is the error, the stuff that you don't have. And we can check on this by doing a fit value, model fit, those are your predicted values, compared to the residuals, 
and see if they have a pattern. One way you can do this is with using a QQ plot, or less ideally you can plot it out with a histogram, but QQ plots are the better choice here. And violating this assumption means that the coefficients you're going to generate, they're still going to be okay, but your standard errors could be off, which means you're going to get a less reliable hypothesis test and less, re less reliable confidence intervals. Remember, if your standard errors are off, standard errors get divided into your coefficients, which give you your t-scores. t-scores determine your p-values. So if anything happens to your errors, that's going to throw off your ability to do hypothesis testing and generate intervals around uh, your coefficients as well. No influential outliers is our next one. And again, this is one that's not an official assumption, but having outliers can still mess with your regression. How can you find your influential outliers? Now, we know there's outliers, and then there's something called an influential outlier, which is where this is going to pertain to. We find them by using a special plot called a leverage versus residual plot. And by the way, these specialized plots that we're talking about, I'm going to be talking about these in the diagnostics lecture next. So don't worry right now if you have to go look up what is this thing. I'll get it for you, but we, we find the influ influential outliers with this particular kind of plot. And the plot is going to mark off for you. It's going to show you pretty clearly which ones go past these influential thresholds uh, and possibly other things that we need to consider. Violating the assumptions means that we could potentially have biased estimates here, right? Those are biased parameters. That's not good. And it also could bias your standard errors, which is the sums of squares, the regression hypothesis testing, and etc. So what that's saying is the regression line that's going to fit through your data points uh, is not ideally where it should be uh, if your outliers are causing too much trouble. Homoscedasticity, that's the fifth one. Now, that's a fancy stats word, so let me say that for you again. Homoscedasticity. Compare that to heteroscedasticity. Homoscedasticity means that the variance of our errors are constant. They're generally the same. Where heteroscedasticity means that they are not. They are non-constant. This is where we're going to use a specialized plot called a model fit versus residuals. And we identify it that if our residuals look generally randomly distributed, no sorts of patterns going about, we're good. But if you find a pattern effect in your residuals, which usually takes the form of like a cone or a funnel type shape, then the errors are non-constant and we have heteroscedasticity. Having this particular assumption failed, violating the assumption, means again that you're going to have less precise estimates and your significance tests are going to be biased. Your, coefficient, your coefficients will be fine, but the standard errors and the hypothesis tests could be off. The sixth one is that your errors are independent. Now we always like to have independent data, and I didn't list that one here because we already have seven to worry about, but generally speaking you want to have independent data. But in this case, we're talking about errors are independent, your residuals are independent, which means that they're not going to be related to your independent variables that you're using. If your errors are correlating with your independent variables or correlating with themselves, then what you could have are the sign of what we call omitted variables, simultaneity, which means your independent variables are also explaining your dependent, your dependent are also explaining your independent. It messes with the whole causal idea of things. We're not going to worry about too much into what that means in this class. Uh, you might be using the improper model. The variables that have been measured could have been measured incorrectly, or you could have some sort of other errors that are presenting themselves, uh, issues that are presenting themselves in your errors. You could also have a problem called autocorrelation, also known as serial correlation. These tend to be issues like something about time is sneaking its way in, and time is messing with your errors here. Okay, So all sorts of reasons why your errors might not be independent. We can check for this for a few different types of plots. You can look at a model fit versus residuals to again see if there's some sort of shapes. And you can also do individually, you can check your error residuals against each IV separately to see how they're tracking out. So if you've got problems with your primary plot, you can look back one variable at a time and track out which ones might be causing the issues. Uh, and if time is another option, if you have a way to model time, you can put time measured against your residuals uh, and see if there's patterns popping up that way. Violating these particular are going to cause you to have biased standard errors, which means your errors are not going to be random, they're not going to be predictable, and because of that, you're going to have poor confidence intervals, bad tests. And violating this particular assumption takes away a nice little characteristic that we like to have. 
This is another fancy stats term. You don't have to remember it and know it, but I just want to expose you to the idea of independent and identically distributed, or IID. IID is an assumption that our errors are independent. And if we violate the independence, then we can say that we do not have independent and identically distributed errors. It's just this nice little badge that we get to wear uh, if we pass this assumption. And is generally assumption for linear regression. The last one is called multicollinearity, and we want no multicollinearity. This happens when your independent variables are too correlated with each other. I stressed variables because right now we're dealing with simple linear regression and we only have one independent variable. So we don't have to worry about multicollinearity at the moment. But I wanted to tell you about it because I'm introducing the suite of assumptions for OLS regression in the beginning, and it would be wrong of me not to kind of at least tell you about this right now. Now, we're going to come back to this when we get to multiple regression for sure, but the problem that goes on here is that if you have problems with multicollinearity, OLS can't figure out which of your independent variables uh, it should be using when be they become too correlated with each other and it affects your model precision. So just some other rules of thumb, these aren't strong assumptions, but things we might want to keep in mind is that your primary IV should correlate with your DV. If you want to have some sort of meaningful statistical relationships, there should be a correlate there. Uh, it's less important when you have non-causally related variables. We'll talk more about this when we get to multiple regression. You should have a sample size of at least 20. That allows us to have central limit theorem kicking in. We can then apply ideas about the sampling distribution to our data. When you have under 20, things start to fall apart and you don't get your buddy central limit theorem on your side. And the other soft rule of thumb is it's good to have at least 10 to 20 observations per independent variable. That n is 20, that's coming in here since we only have one independent variable. When you have multiple independent variables, we want to have that per independent variable that you've got. And this helps us preserve our degrees of freedom and keep our regression model tuned nicely there. So this is going to kind of wrap up our talk on OLS assumptions. This was heavily on the theory side, so make sure you're taking your notes and kind of going through what assumptions we need to test. And in the next video on regression diagnostics, I'm going to show you how we can test most of these assumptions here. The ones that we don't test in the next video, we're going to cover in multiple regression. But I'll see you all then.